Okay. I am joined today here with Jessica Reynolds. Uh, thank you so much for being here on my YouTube channel. I wanted to talk today about uh, addiction, eating disorders, um, because that's really what my channel is about. And the, the reason why I, I reached out to you is because I saw your uh, uh, story on how you got started on this journey. And I'm like, oh, wow. So I really wanted to kind of not really pick your brain, but to, to ask you questions and to really kind of, you know, from your perspective and your experience, and I know that you deal with a lot of people, um, mm -hmm. what is, and, and my first question is, to you, what is an eating disorder slash addiction? Yeah, you know, a lot of people don't see those as the same thing, but eating disorders are addiction. They are food addiction. Um, I personally struggled with eating disorders since a very young age. I became bulimic at age 11. Um, and but eating disorders are generally classified as anorexia, bulimia, compulsive overeating, and binge eating disorder. And the problem in that community is they aren't treated as addiction, but they truly are. Right. It isn't just being addicted to, to the food. It's addicting. It's being addicted to the behaviors, to the feeling that it gives us, just to the stuffing down of emotions. Um, people ask, but what is that? How can you treat an eating disorder like addiction? Because you need food to live. And the reality is we have to treat it like addiction. Um, when I look up the definition of addiction, uh, I love the synonyms that it gives. It gives the synonyms of enslavement. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's so huge because that's how you feel when you have anorexia, bulimia, binge eating disorder, compulsive eating, you are enslaved, not just to the food that's attached, but to the behavior and what you think that that behavior does for you or what you believe that that destructive behavior does for you. So I think addiction and eating disorders are the same thing. All eating disorders are based in addiction um, and you can't treat an eating disorder effectively without treating it as the addiction that it is. And in my experience, um, I was in and out of six eating disorder hospitals over the years and none of them treated my eating disorder as if it was an addiction. You wow. know, um, we treat addictions by telling, say, an alcoholic, they go to rehab and they say, you can never drink again. And they have right. to come to acceptance of that. Right. But what the way that they treat us when we are, when we have food addiction is they say, well, you should go and have all things in moderation. That's how you know when you're well. And it doesn't work. It's like telling the, the alcoholic, well, you can go have a drink on the weekend with your friends when you're well. Yeah. And so yeah. addiction is the background. It is the basis of all food, all food behaviors, I believe, eating disorders. Right, right. You know, when, and that, that is so true because with me, my addiction slash eating disorder, you know, I went to a, to therapy uh, not too long ago and she said eating disorder. And I went, no wait, It's addiction because I'm addicted to sugar and carbs. And mm -hmm. I came home and asked my husband, I'm like, you know, she said eating disorder. I'm saying addiction, you know, and he's like, well, why can't it be both? Yes, and it and, is. And I, I really, you know, Jessica, it took me a while to chew on that. And I'm, I'm really still kind of like, okay. And what you described of what an eating disorder is, mm. that's exactly what mine, I don't know, I guess, turned into or if it, you know, that's what it was all along. Eating disorders are progressive. They okay. start off as a small thing. 
and throughout your lifetime, they get worse. And what I've noticed is in response to trauma, it expedites the speed of that eating disorder wow. getting worse. So um, in my experience, most people who have an eating disorder, they really can't pinpoint where it started, but they can tell you the times in their life where it flared up or got worse. Okay. So I look at it like any other, an eating disorder is a disease. Um, I like to think of it like as we are just wired a little bit different. We have a predisposition towards problems with right. food. And not everybody in the world is like that, but we are. Right. And when we encounter things in our life, whether it's trauma, whether it's stress, whether it's unexpected changes, those things tend to bring out and kind of flare up that wiring that isn't quite the same as everybody else. And our eating disorder, it progresses. And I think that's important to know too, is that an eating disorder always gets worse. You never stay the same. Um, if you don't get treatment for an eating disorder, it always, it always goes to the next level. Um, the other thing that you might not realize with the eating disorders is they can morph. Like I started off my primary eating disorder was bulimia. I would binge and purge or take a lot of laxatives to try to empty out my system. But over the years, I really struggled. I went through a horrible bout of anorexia. Um, and then other times I was deeply entrenched in like compulsively overeating or binge eating. Um, my low weight when I had anorexia was 115 pounds. My high weight with compulsive eating and binge eating was 309. It's okay. all the same disorder. It is wow. all the same thing. We are wired differently when it comes to food and trauma tends to bring that out. And, and you say trauma, and I, I don't know if, if you have looked at any of mine, but my mother passed away three years ago. And in fact, it was September, and September is a horrible month for me. And this time around, you know, and, and I've, I've heard with, I was in another group of, uh, for addiction, which they treated like, uh, they didn't do eating. They did alcohol, drugs, you know, and I was their first one that they came to and they said, uh, we don't have time for you for chocolate cake, you know, deal. And I'm like, no. And then when I tried to explain it to them and they're like, she's just like a heroin addict, you know, they don't see it as deadly. I think that's why people don't treat it as seriously because they don't see it as something that will kill you, but it will in fact yes. kill you. An eating disorder will kill you in a couple of different ways. It can kill you because if you have anorexia or bulimia, you know, you can actually damage your body so bad that you can't live on the nutrition that you're getting. But if you have compulsive overeating, I mean, I almost died at 309 pounds because the amount of sickness, the amount of mental health issues that were compounded by being that weight and by feeling so bad about myself and not recognizing myself in my own body, I was suicidal. Yeah. And so the eating disorder can take your life because it takes your brain too. It takes your mind. Right. Right. And so people don't see that as as urgent or as serious as the other eating disorders or they don't, or other addictions. Um, but I have many, many people that have come to me over the last several years for help and they have overcome heroin addiction. They have overcome alcoholism. They have overcome nicotine addiction. Um, and they say, this is so much harder because with alcohol, yes. with heroin, yes. with all those things, you stay away from it completely, right. right? You you absolutely avoid it. You don't go around the people that you used to go around. Right. And with food, we still have to have some type of food in our life. We can't avoid it yeah. completely. Yeah. And so in my experience with, at, with addiction, um, those people who have overcome past addictions consistently tell me that their food addiction, their eating disorder, is the hardest thing to overcome and part of it is too is we don't have the support of society because right. it is socially acceptable right. you can indulge in your addiction anywhere right <laughs> you know? 
and and no one is going to say anything to you. In no. fact, they're more likely to say something to you when you start to do something healthy, like eat meat or eat real food, right? Than they would when you're eating pizza every single day. You know, and and that is so true. You're talking about uh, the society part of it, because when I was and, and I'm I'm the type that I binge. Um, mm-hmm. And I, I binge eat um, and I will, I, that's what I did. I'd stand in the pantry and I, I talked about this, my story on, on my channel that I stood in my pantry and just, you know, and was looking and, you know, to see if any, anybody was there. And, you know, it was, it was almost accepted and almost okay for me to do that. But when I started carnivore, say, several years ago everybody's like you oh, guys yeah this is you're gonna die from that i have right. two heads here and you know i'm it's that's not okay but it's okay for me to be 262 pounds that was my highest it was 262 it's okay for me to do that and i can't even walk across the yard right um, it's interesting though um the way you just described that binge eating, I think it might be helpful for people, your listeners and viewers to hear, um, how do I know if the behavior that I have is disordered? Because society accepts it. They don't see it as a bad thing. You said, I'm looking around to see if anybody's coming or looking. Yeah, I'm hiding. The first, the very first way you know that you have an eating disorder is you have shame around the things you are doing with food. Oh, wow. And so if somebody is watching or they are listening to this and you do things that you feel shame around or that you feel the need to hide or keep in secret, you have an eating disorder. Um, and maybe you've never seen it before, but it's really important just to acknowledge that people who are not disordered don't have shame around their food behaviors. And so maybe it's eating out of the pantry or the refrigerator, like I I did the same thing. Um, Or maybe it's just going through a drive-thru and pretending that you're ordering food for a lot of people, but it's really all for you. Um, You know, or- Wow, I did that too. Or hiding wrappers or eating normally in front of people. And then um, when you get by yourself, you eat a lot more. All yes. those things are things we do and, and they, they make us feel shameful. They make us feel like we're duplicitous, like we are dishonest. And if anybody's listening to this and they thought, and they're thinking like, well, I don't have an eating disorder. I mean, yes, I overeat. You have an eating disorder if you do those behaviors. And um, just briefly, if it's okay with you, I wanna describe the difference between binge eating disorder and compulsive eating, because a lot of people don't know that. So binge eating disorder is when you eat a large amount of food in a short period of time. Okay. Um, You basically are shoving it in as much as you can, a lot of times until it hurts. Or until Um, you you get sick. Right, I was gonna say, you may or may not purge afterwards, either by, you can purge by throwing up, you can purge by over-exercising, you can purge by taking laxatives or diuretics, or you can purge by starving. All those things are bulimic. Anything that you do to try to undo that eating that you did is a bulimic activity. I think that's really important. But the difference is binge eating is when you eat a lot of food as much as you possibly can shove in at a fast rate until really you can't step anymore. Right, And it may or may, may not be followed by a purge, but compulsive eating is a thing a lot of people struggle with and they don't understand that they have an eating disorder. Compulsion means I get this idea in my head that I've got to have this certain thing and I can't stop thinking about it. I may not binge, but I know I shouldn't eat this um, because it's harmful to my health or because it's making me sick or because it's making me overweight, but I can't stop myself from eating it. That compulsion usually happens in response to emotions. Like I feel angry, lonely, sad, tired. And I get this, this thought loop in my head. The only thing that's gonna make me feel better 
is to go and eat, get this pie from the store or right. this pint of ice cream. And, and that may not be a full on binge. You might say, well, I don't have an eating disorder because I don't stuff in so much that it hurts. But compulsive eating is when you get that in your head and you cannot talk yourself out of doing it. The only thing that makes you stop is actually taking the action and giving into that thought that you have. Um, a lot of people have compulsive eating and they don't realize they have a problem. I think it's easier to recognize you have a problem when it's binging because it's so extreme. Right. But compulsive eating really, again, it causes people to feel shame. They wake up in the morning and they say, I'm going to eat well today. I'm going to take care of myself today. I'm not going to, I'm going to eat healthy. And the next thing they know, they're doing the exact opposite. And it's because maybe something stressful happened at work and they find themselves in the break room eating some cookies. And that's right. not eating, that's compulsively eating in response to a stressful situation. That is an eating disorder, compulsive eating. Um, and then compulsive overeating is, it can even be healthy food. I could have a, all like keto food, all healthy yeah. food, nothing inflammatory. And once I start eating, I hit that full point, but I can't stop because it tastes so good. Or I just feel compelled to finish all of it. That right. is also an eating disorder. So uh, wow. I just want to clarify that because there's so much opportunity. People do not talk about compulsive eating. And uh, anytime I have an opportunity, I like to try to get that in there because there's so many people that could be helped with that. And they right. just struggle with it alone because they don't see it as a full-on eating disorder and in fact when they go to a therapist a psychiatrist because that doesn't fit into that binge eating order um disorder um definition they say well you know just go on a diet they'll just tell them to eat less move more they don't help them with compulsive eating because it doesn't match any of the doesn't match anorexia, it doesn't match bulimia, and it right. doesn't match binge eating, but they're still enslaved to a behavior. Even if they're not eating tons, not quantity, they're doing a thing that they regret deeply and they wish they could stop. Wow, that, that is such good information. And I, I was thinking about it just the other day while you were describing what the difference is, is I made some um, sugar-free jelly. Uh, I'd got some muscadines and it was sugar-free jelly. My system does not handle artificial sweetener at all. Um, and, but yet I had it in my brain. Oh, well, it's sugar-free. It's okay. Mm. And, you know, I, I'm transparent on, on this channel and, and with everybody. I ate half the jar in one sitting and then so that's the difference that was compulsive eating versus your normal binge eating see how that eating disorder morphs it's not always the same thing it, it did and then after I got that it's like once you get that sweet taste you know you can't and it turns on the addiction big yes. times, like now I need something else now I need something else well then the next day and I left it alone but the next day, that's all I thought about. Mm -hmm. And so my father had gone into his room and, you know, my husband was gone to work. What did I do? I'm going in the refrigerator and I'm, and I'm looking, you know, well, and then I get a handful. Uh, yes. Then I get a handful of walnuts because I'm thinking, oh, well, because, and it all started with. I wanted peanut butter and jelly mm -hmm. because so I heard you say for. something I heard you say something and that this is huge when we have disordered eating we have a voice of sabotage in our head and most people don't realize it they think that well I decided I wanted some sugar-free jelly and the reality is we have that voice of sabotage that says you need sugar-free jelly mm -hmm. and it will keep harassing you, mm -hmm. you sugar-free jelly. Come on. And it'll bargain. It'll say, it'll say, you know, it's sugar-free. It's fine. It's so much better than right. eating real peanut butter and jelly. So by right. the end of this conversation in your head, you think, 
I decided I was going to have some sugar-free jelly. Right. And what has really happened is you have gotten sucked into the voice of sabotage. Yep. Yep. I call that voice of sabotage ed and I, and it's short for eating disorder. And so there's an opportunity when you struggle with things like that to start to separate what is my voice and what is Ed's voice? What is the voice of the eating disorder, the enemy voice? And wow. so Ed says, Ed says, go ahead and have that. It's eating season. It's comfort season. It's fall. It's starting to get cool outside. You deserve a comfort food. He says all these things and you think, well, yeah. And you're going along with it because you're thinking, I'm thinking this back and forth in my own mind with myself. You're really having this conversation with Ed. Yeah. Yeah. The eating disorder. And the whole point is to get you to eat something that will turn on that compulsive eating. It never ends with just the thing that you think that you're going to do. It always goes a step further every single time. If you already know from your own personal history that you don't tolerate sweet tastes well because they turn on compulsion mm -hmm. and you give in to that, it means you have given in to the voice of sabotage. You didn't bargain with yourself and decide to do it. You gave in to Ed. And I think it's really helpful to start to realize that um, all of us that have an eating disorder, those of us who struggle with compulsive eating, we always fall for an ed lie when we give in to doing things we know aren't good for us. And um, that's one of the things that I help people work through is separating their voice from Ed's voice. So that wow. they can, um, And then after you listen to the voice and you give in, then there comes the shame and the regret and the, because that's where I, I was at. And then comes, okay, well, I'll exercise more or that's the bulimia, right? Uh, or I will eat better or, you know, because today I was thinking, okay, so last two weeks I have stopped doing the protein modified sparing fast thing and just eat just in maintenance just because I was not eating enough and I was wow. over exercising so I thought okay I'm going to take a break mm -hmm. well it lasted about two weeks and then here comes the jelly and the walnuts and the peanut butter you know and then it's like okay well so today I'm going to eat better and I'm going to go back to walking again and, and this is what goes on in my mind. And I'm thinking, okay, so I gave in. And so let's try to walk it off. Let's try to, like you, you know, like you were talking about earlier. The I, I would call that bulimic thinking. Any behavior where we feel like we have to take an action that will undo an eating event is bulimic behavior. And you can even just from what you've told me today, your eating disorder goes from binge eating to compulsive eating to bulimic behavior. And so it's interesting to see how that morphs. But when you give the, the problem is when we give into a small, when we give into what feels like a small thing, like Ed, the voice of sabotage will say to us, um, it'll only be one bite. Yeah. And we think, yeah. okay, yeah, it's been a really long time. I can probably control myself this time. Yeah. And we take one bite. The very next thing he says is, you're not perfect. You already took one bite. Might as well eat it all. And you then might as well finish it. it. Yes. Exactly. So if there's anybody listening who doubts that there is a voice of sabotage, this is proof because Ed the eating disorder, the voice of sabotage says the same thing to me, to you, to hundreds and hundreds of other people that I've talked to. It's not wow. your thoughts, it's Ed thoughts. And when you can start to identify Ed, you can speak back to him and you can say, actually, Ed, one bite's never enough for me. I always eat it all. So I'm not going to take the first bite, but you have to first recognize that you are not bargaining with yourself. You're not giving yourself permission to have that bite. You are listening to a sabotaging voice. And once you can do that, it becomes easier to shut it down because you're not fighting within yourself. Then you're not fighting back and forth with yourself. You are fighting Ed 
And I think when we're fighting, we're using our fight not to fight against ourselves, but to fight against the real enemy, which is that sabotaging voice. We can win that fight. You know, th this this has been uh, so much valuable information, and, and I really hope that people do take this and, and really think about this, because I'm sitting here going, what? You know, because nobody, I've been in therapy for years, and, you know, every therapist that I have ever gone to is, okay, well, you control this, and you can, you know, but they haven't given me the tools to understand this and to know how they don't understand and i will say that i mean i i had so many therapists um you know like i said i started i was doing weird food stuff way before 11. like i would hide and eat i would offer to make lunches for my brother and sister so i could eat while i was doing it like i already had that wiring that that yeah. i'm predisposition to food stuff and I dealt with some trauma in my life and I think I started to overeat um, and then when I was 11 my body started to develop like I started to get curvy my friends were still straight up and down skinny right. and I thought how can I still eat the way I want to that gives me pleasure and not get fat and I thought I came up with this great idea of throwing up I never heard of bulimia. Right. And so it's interesting because, you know, that was back in the 80s and it's just it, eating disorders were not talked about. I no. really thought I came up with that. Like, here's a great way for me to be able to eat and not get fat. Right. Not have a consequence. So that was very confusing. But I did that from age 11 to 16 before my parents realized it. So I had done that behavior for five years. But starting at age 16, I had therapist after therapist after therapist after therapist, eating disorder, hospital, help groups, Overeaters Anonymous, every piece of help that was out there. And none of them, not one, made me better. And it's because none of them treated this as the addiction. And even some of the great therapists who I knew truly cared, they don't know how it is. I think that, and I'm gonna say this, I think it's really important for me to say this. I suffered for decades with this, the, the shame, the secrecy, being fat, being skinny, being in the middle, like all these things I suffered and suffered and I would cry and I would pray and be like, God, why? why yes. am i suffering why can't i get free from this thing right and my parents used to say to me jessica one day all this will have purpose and i would be so angry to hear that i'm like there's no way this pain and this shame and this sickness that i go through can ever mean anything right. and i believe now i am 47 years old and in february um, it'll be six years that I have not benched and purged. I don't wow. engage in any eating disorders. I have not had sugar or grains or anything, starches. I've eaten only healthy foods now. Six years I've been in recovery for five of those years. God has called me to be the person who says, listen, this is the stuff I didn't get from therapists. This is the stuff I didn't get from hospitals. I can tell you, I can help people through their pain because I know, mm -hmm. and I know what it took for me to get well. So I am so grateful. You know, when you can be grateful for years of pain, yeah. that you're truly yeah. healed. I think it really takes someone who has been through it and overcome it to help other people do that. And that's why it's so important that I talk that you talk, that other people who actually come through this thing, that we share our stories. Um, because again, I don't know that there's any type of training or therapy that can prepare a person who hasn't lived with this stuff to help a person who does. So right. that's why we are called to be the voices for this. You know, um, even my, uh, I went through social work and that sort of thing. And, you know, they have some type of counseling that you go through, you know, mm -hmm. to teach you how to talk to families and how to, you know, to do all this. And, you know, like you said, I, 
here recently, you know, God has told me, okay, I want you to start a YouTube channel. And I'm going, you want me to do what? <laughs> you know, and I'm like, but God, I'm still in the middle of this. I'm still, yes. you yes. know, I'm still battling it. And he's like, okay, yes, but I'm going to give you opportunities. And you were saying a while ago, you know, why is this pain? Why is my childhood, my trauma, you know, losing my mother being, cause I, I grew up with an alcoholic dad and then I became an alcoholic instead of running away from it. I ran to it. Right. You know? And then it was like, there's other childhood traumas that I had that I'm like, God, really, you want me to, to, you know, go on YouTube and tell everybody this. Yeah. And he's like, yeah, I do. And I'm like, God, I'm not equipped to do this. I, I, I don't have the training. I'm not a coach. I, I don't. He's like, that's okay. You can connect with people. He uses us in our weakness. And in fact, that's why he can use us. You take a person who thinks they know because they've had a certain amount of training or they've had a certain title or, you know, they, they tend to be less open. We have this raw spirit. And when we are radically obedient, when we're called to do something that's way outside our comfort zone, if we just let God take us and do it, amazing things happen. Um, I think when he called me to start helping people, I didn't have any training at that time either. I really had nothing. I was still in the middle of my journey. I had not lost on my weight. I did lose 146 pounds. Awesome. Um, and like I said, I, I, I call it food sober, but um, yeah. the very first, it will be six years that I've been food sober. And when he called me, I was not even quite a year in. And I said, no, I have to, I can't help people because I'm still on my journey. Right. And I would say I am still on my journey now. I still learn things every day. I'm still humbled. I'm still growing. But um, I tried to kind of deny that. And it just kept coming back around this opportunity to speak. And so, um, so what I would like to say, though, is that Ed, that voice of sabotage that says it'll only be one bite, is the same voice that plants fear in us to do the thing that we're called to do. You can't do that. You're not experienced enough. You can't do that. No one will listen. You can't do that. You don't have a title. You don't have the training. Right. All these reasons why. And then if you look like in the Bible, oh my gosh, look at the people that God used. They were all, all weak people, people who had addiction, people who had flaws. People that um, were all up really in sin. Thing. Yeah, I mean, I always think of like, you know, David was like God's chosen and he and he made so many mistakes and he went through depression, read Psalms, you know, he cried and he prayed and he begged God, like, why have you forsaken me? And yet God was still with him and, and he stuck by him even through his sin and his pain and everything else. And it just tells us, you know, the world says we have to be one thing in order to help people. All we really have to do is be radically obedient to that calling. The thing that makes our heart rise up in excitement. That's yeah. the thing. And the enemy Ed, the voice of sabotage will try to shut that down because he knows you're going to be a blessing to people. You know, and, and that is so true because I have, I have done videos and I'm like, nobody's going to listen to this. Nobody's going, nobody's going, you know, and even when I went, uh, Jimmy Moore put out a thing on Instagram and said, Hey, who wants to be interviewed? And I'm like, and, and then I thought, Lord have mercy. God will no. make you brave. Right. God will make you brave. And you'll be like, did I actually do that? And then, and then the enemy will say, you're, you're so stupid. Why did you do that? No one's going to listen to you. He's not going to pick you. Like you're not good enough. You know, that's the enemy. It's the same enemy voice. Ed, and you have to shut that down. And one of my favorite sayings in life, and it has served me well through this recovery process is fear is a liar. Yes. Fear is meant to keep us stuck where we are. Yes. And on the other side of fear are tremendous blessings to ourselves and others. So the enemy wants to keep us in fear to keep us from being blessed and being a blessing. 
And so leaning into fear and doing that thing anyway, being radically obedient is a, you don't have to be afraid because you can trust and believe that something good is going to come from it. Sometimes you know, the more inadequate I feel, the better things turn out. <laughs> You know, and, and that's that's true because I watched the the video, uh, the playback of Jimmy and, and I, and I looked and went, "Who was that woman?" Because, and I even told my husband, I said, "I watched this video and I saw a completely different person, a confident, a you know, a a energetic, a funny, you know, I." Even one of my friends, she goes, girl, you did good. And I'm like, that wasn't me. When you that step outside of yourself, yes. When you step outside of yourself and you allow God to just speak through you, you don't have to practice and plan what your words are going to be. He will take things in the direction that they need to go in. Um, I am so grateful. I've had the opportunity to speak on 25 or 26 podcasts. Wow. over the years and I, I'm like you know I feel like I'm nobody I mean I do I'm like I, I am nobody in this community like there's lots of like keto famous people I'm like I'm not one of them but God has always put me in the path of people who have given me a platform to tell my story and speak and I can remember being deathly afraid like God why like like okay I said yes to this but I don't know what I'm gonna say and one of the things that I realized was early on he, if I pray, Lord, I don't know how you want to use this podcast or this YouTube or whatever it is, but you can do it anything you want. You can take it any direction when you want to. He prompted me not to try to write down a list of things that I wanted to say. Instead, he calls me to give in to his leading and let the conversation just happen with people. And it has turned into just such beautiful, amazing things that have, have right. blessed me and blessed other people right. like today. Well, and, and you know, you're exactly right because before this Zoom meeting, I was like, uh, what do I say? And I, I knew that the question I wanted to ask you, the, the number one question when I first reached out to you, the number one question is, what is your definition? Because I want to see what everybody's definition of uh, addiction, eating disorder is, because I want their, their story, their yeah. opinion, their experience instead, not just mine. Right. And, you know, that's, that was the only question that I had. And, and I'm sitting here this morning praying, okay, God, um, what are we going to do the rest of the time? <laughs> right, right. It's like, uh, so how's this going to go? And it just, it's just morphed into this awesome, you know, thing that, that I've learned so much about. And I'm hoping that everybody that, that is watching this on my channel, get some little snippet, uh, some little help uh, of something, some little glimmer of hope, you know? The enemy wants us sick and he wants us to be quiet and God wants us well and he wants us healthy and he wants us vibrant so we can be a light and we are a light and someone might come to your channel and they might come to me because they need help with eating disorders or food addiction and um, in the end, what we are meant to do is point to him. Right. And so everything eventually does, as long as we are obedient to do that as the moment is right. And as he leads us, then we never have to be afraid. You don't have to worry about success. You don't have to worry about, you know, I, I've been a coach for um, five years and I've never, ever had to worry about getting clients or, you know, what I was going to do. Um, I believe every single day that God sends me the people specifically who need me. And the truth is, if someone else can help them, I want them to go to someone else. I want only people that need me specifically. And God has always sent me those people. And um, I'm just incredibly grateful for that. And again, always incredible, uh, incredibly grateful for opportunities to talk. Well, I, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to, 
uh, sign off here in a few minutes because I, our time is, is getting cut short uh, from Zoom. But tell everybody um, where they can reach you, how they can reach you. I know that you've got a, a group coming up with um, Mary come mm -hmm. starting soon, but I know that you always start, y'all always start other sure. meetings after that. So um, uh, my friend Mary uh, Roberts and I have run an eating disorder recovery group, a food addiction eating disorder recovery group since 2018. We've been doing that and we're coming up on our 50 groups that we've done and that so awesome. many people, you know, we, we dig deep into some of the things that we, you know, you and I started talking about here today. So I do do those. Um, I also, we have one coming up at the end of October, but we usually do about one a month. Um, and I personally have some groups that I teach. I do, like right now I have Obsession Free October going on. Um, it's where I teach people how to change behaviors in order to get success without having to count macros and do things like that. I'm doing something similar for November, but in November, I am incorporating the element of gratitude in it. How do you get to a place of daily gratitude and use that to stay food sober and well and get results? And then I do personal one-on-one -on -one coaching. Over the years, I've worked with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people with eating disorders and um, I do that through focusing on nutrition and behavior modification. And um, people can follow me or reach me at um, Coach Jessica on both Facebook and on Instagram. Um, I work for ketogeniclifestylecoaching.com and I have been there for uh, going on five years. And uh, you can click on my bio to see the link for all these different kind of programs and read about them. But um, I'm always grateful and um, I love to have people reach out to me. If you want to send me a message on Instagram, you're interested or you want links to things, feel free to do that. Um, but you can also email me at jessica.reynolds at ketogeniclifestylecoaching.com. And my name is spelled J-E-S-S-Y-C-A, uh, Jessica, Jessica Reynolds, but it's Jessica with a Y, Coach Jessica. Thank you very much. I do appreciate that. And I my hope pleasure. that people do reach out to you. And I I've learned so much in just this short amount of time, you know, as well. And so that I can, you know, tell others about, hey, look, this, this is what I learned. Guess what I learned? Because, you know, when you learn something new, you get excited and you go, hey, guess what? <laughs> that's awesome. And that's what I love to do. I love to spread the word. I can't help everybody, but I can help you. And then you can help more people. And right. I love that we spread the word in this community. We speak up about things nobody talks about. And that is the shameful eating behaviors. You don't have to be ashamed. And uh, there is help out there. Thank you very much, Jessica. I really appreciate it. And everybody on my YouTube channel, check her out. You've got her information. She's on Instagram, Facebook, whatever. Reach out to her she'll have some great resources and if she can't help you she'll direct you to somebody who can thank you very uh, much jessica i appreciate thank it you. have a good day you too